Hello class, welcome to lecture 7 of our course. In this lecture we'll be discussing uh, energy, uh, work, and the conservation of energy. So <clears throat> we'll start with addressing energy itself. Now what is it? Uh, it's a term that you almost un undoubtedly have heard of before, right? Uh, we use it in our colloquial language. Uh, feeling low energy, or I have you know high energy today. I have a lot of energy, and um, and that's kind of kind of like what what it means in the context of physics. Um, in physics, energy is a physical quantity uh, that basically represents the capacity or the ability to do something. Of a system, so the system, if it has energy, it can do something, right? Um, and what is that something? That something is work. We haven't discussed uh, what work is, but uh, technically, the definition of energy is the capacity to do work. Um, you could think of it as if a system has energy, it has the capacity to change or do something to. The environment outside the system, right? And, and and that's physically kind of what we say whenever we have energy, right? If I have a lot of energy, that means that I, you know, I I, I feel like I can get stuff done, like I can manipulate the environment around me to a large degree, right? So in that way, the colloquial sense in which we use energy um, is is very similar to the what energy means in the context of physics. Now, uh, others uses the word energy like, oh, they're putting off some positive energy or negative energy. So that doesn't translate to physics because energy is a scalar in physics, uh, which means it only has a magnitude, right? Uh, it doesn't have a direction. So you can't have positive or negative energy, good or bad energy. Uh, it's either you have energy or you have zero energy in physics. Uh, there's no this thing is negative energy. So that's you know let's, without getting mathematically into it, that's what energy is. Um, it's easier to uh, define energy in its individual forms because in physics, uh, energy can take multiple forms. Um, so one form of energy is motion. If an object is in motion, it's said to have energy. So that's energy associated with motion. There could be, there's also energy associated with an object's position within a potential field or a, a force field. Um, so uh, we know the forces that act through fields are gravity, uh, the electrostatic force and, and, and magnetism. And so there are gravitational, electric, and magnetic potential energies that um, result from an object's place in a, in a corresponding field, electric, magnetic, or gravitational field. Then there is um, a pot a potential energy that's stored in an elastic object, like a spring or a rubber band, right? You stretch it, you deform it, energy is stored in, in that uh, by stretching it. Uh, we call that elastic potential energy. Then we have the energy associated with uh, the movement of molecules or atoms that make up a substance. Um, that's, you know, wasn't that the energy associated with motion? It is on a microscopic scale. It's the motion of the atoms and molecules. But when we add all that energy up, we call that thermal energy. Um, and so the thermal energy is another form of energy uh, that's what you might say, might say, might say heat, right? If something has a high temperature, has a lot of thermal energy. And another form of energy is chemical potential energy, energy that's stored in the chemical bonds of molecules that can be released during a chemical reaction. So there's chemical potential energy stored in gasoline. Right, and our car converts that chemical potential energy into the energy associated with motion. Right, it gets your car moving from rest, or it converts into gravitational potential energy by 
moving you to a different place in a gravitational field. Uh, and there's chemical potential energy in the food you eat, right? You eat food and then your body metabolizes that food through chemical reactions and it extracts that chemical potential energy, the energy stored in those food molecules and it converts it into thermal energy, like the heat, your body heat, and uh, energy associated with motion, right? You move your body or, or, or potential energy, right? If you walk upstairs, you're changing your potential, gravitational potential energy. So energy can take many different forms in nature. The first form, we're going to talk about two forms in this lecture, kinetic energy and gravitational potential energy. Um, and the first form we're going to talk about kinetic energy, uh, you might uh, remember the word kinetics from earlier lectures, but kinetics is motion, right? So kinetic energy is the energy associated with motion, right? So obviously if something's at rest, if it's going to no longer be at rest, something has to be given to it, right? It has to be given energy, right? Why? Well, one reason is inertia, right? It has, it has inertia that has to be overcome. So we know that the amount of energy an object that's moving, amount of kinetic energy it has that, that's moving, is going to be somewhat related to the inertia of the object. Uh, for translation, that's just its mass. So it's going to be related to its mass. So the more mass an object has when it's moving, the more energy it has when it's moving. And since kinetic energy is the energy associated with movement, not only do we have to take into consideration its inertia, but it's also motion itself, right? So if an object is moving, it has a velocity, right? Remember the arrow indicates it's a vector. But did he say that energy is not a vector? It's a scalar, it doesn't have a sign, positive or negative. I did say that. Uh, and so the product of mass and velocity, that would be a vector, right? And we, we just covered that. That's momentum. That's the momentum of an object. So it can't, energy cannot be, kinetic energy can't be simply the product of an object's mass and its velocity, because this is a vector. It's actually the product of the object's mass and the square of its velocity. And remember, when you square a vector, you eliminate the sign, right? Because if it's a negative value, negative times negative is a positive. Positive times a positive is a positive. So anytime you square a vector, you're erasing the sign of it. You're transforming it from a vector quantity to a scalar quantity. All right? And so it's the product of mass, velocity squared, and then there's also this one half. And that's how we define kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy of a moving object is equal to one half times its mass times its velocity squared. So um, if we have two objects moving at the same speed, the heavier object, the object that has more mass, will have more kinetic energy. The object that has low, smaller mass will have less kinetic energy. Two objects of the same mass moving at different speeds. The objects moving faster will have more kinetic energy. Objects moving slower will have less kinetic energy. Kinetic energy, uh, we typically don't think of mass as changing, right? An object that's moving, we, we assume, assume its mass is constant. So really in mechanics, the study of motion, we generally think of an object's energy being mainly a function of its speed, its velocity. And as you can see, if we say double, so kinetic energy varies proportionally with the square of the velocity. So if we double the speed, we would quadruple the amount of energy the object has. If we if we'd, um, increase the speed by a factor of three, the resulting energy the object has would be increased by a factor of nine, and so forth. So a simple calculation, now if we had an object that has mass, of one kilogram and its velocity is say 10 meters per second, then the kinetic energy 
of that object would be one half times its mass, one kilogram, times its velocity squared, 10 meters per second squared. So that gives us one, well, 10 squared is 100, times one is 100, times one half is 50. And the units are kilograms, meters squared per second squared. Okay, so that's the amount of kinetic energy this object has. Now, this unit, the kilogram meter squared per second squared, uh, we call that something, all right? Uh, this is a derived unit, and one kilogram meter squared per second squared is equal to one joule, all right? So joule is the unit of energy. So that's one particular unit of energy. There are other units of energy that are used. Um, so uh, especially for thermal energy, like a calorie is a very common unit of energy. Or in the English system, a BTU, a bridge thermal unit. So those are other units of energy. Joule is the standard uh, metric unit of energy. So this object has an energy of 50 joules in the form of kinetic energy, right? So it doesn't matter what form energy is in, you'll still have the unit of joules, right? Thermal energy, gravitational potential energy, kinetic energy, chemical potential energy, they'll all be measured in the same units, joules, calories, or whatever. Um, so joules are the unit of of power, uh, sorry, just saw power, I said it, of energy, and it's abbreviated with a capital J, a joule. So that's kinetic energy. It's the energy associated with motion, and the units of energy are joules. Okay? So, let's say we have an object that's at rest, on the surface. And it has a mass m. So it's at rest. So right here, at, while it's at rest, its kinetic energy, which I abbreviate Ke, is equal to zero joules. It has none. It's not moving. It has no energy. It has mass, but it's not moving. Because it has mass, it has inertia. And so if we want it to start moving, we have to per Newton's second law, apply net force on it. So if we apply a force on this object, say in this direction, it's going to start moving, right? It's going to start moving if that's the net force. Let's ignore friction, okay? So if we draw a free body diagram, we have the object's weight acting down, we have the normal force acting up, those cancel each other out, uh, there's no acceleration in the y direction. And so we just have this force F acting to the right. And so the net force in the x direction is this force F to the right. And so F net, this is in the x direction, is equal to F, and that's going to equal M times A. Right? So it's going to have an acceleration in this direction. So it's going to change. Its, its motion is going to change. Its velocity is going to go from zero to some non-zero number. Right? It's going to have some velocity in that direction. So it, it's going to experience a change in kinetic energy. But what is the relationship between this net force, right, the force applied, what is that relationship between the force and that change in kinetic energy, which is the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy. In this case, the initial kinetic energy is zero. So the change in kinetic energy is just the final kinetic energy. Let's call this V final, the initial. The 
that's its change in kinetic energy. So what is the relationship between this force applied and the change in kinetic energy? Because we know that's what's happening. We're applying this net force, and as a result, it starts moving because it has an acceleration for Newton's second law, and as a, as a result of it moving, it now has energy. Well, it turns out that it's the product of the force applied by the distance that acts in that, uh, so the force applied and the distance through which that force is applied. So let's say that force is applied through a distance d. So we pull it through this distance, then we let go. Or we push it through that distance and we let go. So the product of that force and distance is equal to the change in kinetic energy. And if we see, uh, so let me write this. Your force times distance equals change in kinetic energy. Now, I want to emphasize that this force and distance are just not any force and any distance. It has to be the amount of force that's perpendicular to the distance. Right? So this force, the normal force, it is, sorry, I misspoke. I said it's the amount of force that's perpendicular to the distance. It's the amount of force that's parallel to the displacement. That displacement. So this force is through this displacement D. For example, the normal force acts upward, but the object goes through this horizontal displacement because the normal force is completely perpendicular to the object's displacement. That normal force does not change the object's kinetic energy. Similarly, the object's weight acts straight down. And because the object's displacement is purely horizontal, the object's weight does not change the object's kinetic energy. However, this force F acts in this direction, and that's parallel to the displacement. So it's because this force and this displacement are parallel that this force does change the object's kinetic energy. So, if there was a force acting in this direction, and the object's displacement was in that direction, then it's only the amount of force that's parallel to that displacement that will change its kinetic energy. Okay? So the force and the displacement have to be, have to be, have to have some amount of common direction to them in order for it to change its kinetic energy. Right? Now, this, this, this quantity, what are its units? Well, units of force are newtons, and units of displacement or distance is meters. Now, a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared multiplied by meters See, that gives us a kilogram meter squared per second squared. And that is, if you remember, a joule. Which is not surprising because change in kinetic energy should have units of joules. So the value on the other side of the equation also needs to have the units of joules. Okay? Now, we give this quantity a particular name in physics, a force applied through a displacement. That is called work. All right. Whenever a force is applied on an object through a displacement, then work is said to be done on that object. And whenever work is done on an object, it experiences a change in energy. So we apply a force F through this displacement D of this object, and as a result, it experiences a change in kinetic energy. It increases in velocity. All right, so now, this work, work can have a positive or negative sign. Because we could do positive work on an object and if it's positive work, that means the change in kinetic energy is positive. 
So if we do positive work on a system, the change in energy is positive. That means the energy of the system increases. So if we do positive work on the system, we're adding energy to it, which makes sense. Like we're pushing it in the direction it's moving. We're putting positive work into the system. It's adding energy into it, right? It's speeding up. What if at this point we stop applying this force F and through it enters, it slides onto a new surface where there is friction and so it goes at distance D. And while it's traveling on this surface with friction, it slows down to a rest, which we, which intuitively that makes sense, right? If an object is moving, it's sliding, and it is sliding on the surface with friction, it eventually comes to a stop. Why? Well, because the force of friction is acting in this direction, but the displacement that the object undergoes is in this direction. They're in opposite directions. And so whenever the force, in this case the frictional force, it's kinetic friction, times the distance are in the opposite direction, that is negative work. We give this value a negative sign because it's negative work. Because this force is now reducing the energy. It's taking energy out of the system. It's slowing the block down. So this is going to equal its change in kinetic energy, which is going to be negative, right? It has a non-zero kinetic energy here. It has a zero kinetic energy here. So final is zero minus initial non-zero. That's a negative number. So its change in kinetic energy is negative. So the work done on it must be negative. The force must be acting in the opposite direction of the object's displacement, removing work from it. I'm sorry, removing energy from it. So work can be negative. And if a force does negative work on an object, that is decreasing the energy of the object. Because work is equal to the change in kinetic energy. Okay. So let's look at a quick example. Let's use that friction. Let's say a block has a mass of one kilogram and it has an initial velocity of five meters per second. All right? It's sliding on a frictional surf, uh, surface where the force due to kinetic friction, the friction of motion, is equal to 10 newtons. How far does the block slide until it comes to a stop? So here's the block initially. Let's say this is the positive x, this is the positive y. And then it comes to a stop. So now here, v final is equal to zero. And it goes through some displacement d, right? And while it's traveling, the forces acting on it are the weight acts down, the normal force acts up, and this frictional force acts to the left. All right, so what forces do work on the block? Well, the normal force is perpendicular to its displacement, right? Normal force is up, displacement is horizontal. So the work due to the normal force is equal to zero joules. The weight, the work done by the weight is equal to zero joules because the weight is straight down and displacement horizontal, so they're perpendicular. However, the work due to the frictional force is going to equal, well, they are parallel to each other, so the, the frictional force is going to do work. The product of the force times the displacement 
because they're in opposite directions, you get that negative sign. Right? If we use the vectors, the force is negative, displacement is positive. Right? So if we take a negative times a positive, we get a negative. So only the force through friction does work. And then we know the work is equal to the change in kinetic energy, which is the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy. And so, um, if I erase this, come up here, the work done is only the work due to the frictional force, so negative force due to friction times D is equal to the final kinetic energy, which is zero, because it's at rest, the velocity is zero, minus the initial kinetic energy, which is one half n the initial square. And uh, just figure out at zero is the negative k d equals the negative one half n the initial squared. So the negative signs cancel each other out. Solving for d, we get the distance equals one half n the initial square divided by the force due to friction. Come over here and plug in those values with one half times the mass one one kilogram times the velocity five meters per second squared divided by the force of friction, 10 newtons. So five squared is 25, right? 25 divided by two is what, 12 and a half. 12 and a half divided by 10 is 1.25. And our answer boils down to meters. So this block will slide 1.25 meters until it comes to a rest. Because that's through what distance the frictional force, the kinetic frictional force, has to act on the block in order to do enough negative work on the block to change its kinetic energy to bring it to rest. Okay. So that's one example of, of um, uh, work is equal to a change in kinetic energy of an object. So we now define work two. Work is equal to a force applied through some distance, and uh, that force and that displacement or distance have to be parallel to each other. And if the force is in the same direction as the displacement, then it's a positive work. And if the force is in the opposite direction, it's a negative work. And that the work done, well, I thought it's the word walk, not work. The work done on an object is equal to its change in kinetic energy, okay? Now technically, the work done on an object is just it's equal to its change in all forms of energy. We've only looked at kinetic energy now, um, so far. Next we're going to look at a different type of energy, gravitational potential energy. So gravitational potential energy is the energy that an object has in a gravitational field. So let's say we have a surface. We have an object, a mass n, resting on that surface. Now if we want to lift this object up to a height, let's say h. Lift it up to a height h. We have to apply a force upward, f, 
that's at least equal to its weight to get it to start moving up there. And so we apply a force F through a displacement D that's equal to this height, because we're lifting it this height. And so we do work on the object. We apply our force F, which is equal to mg, through a distance d, which is equal to h. So the work we do on it is mgh. So in order to lift an object against gravity, we have to apply a force that's at least equal to its weight upward, a distance equal to the height that we lifted above some reference point. Now obviously we're assuming we're at the surface of the Earth where the strength of the gravitational field is g, 9.8 meters per second squared. So now that it's up here, this object is said to have gravitational potential energy. We did work on it, so we increased its energy. We lifted it through a distance d. We did work on it. The work we did was equal to FH, which was MGH. Now we said work is equal to change in energy, right? We lifted it to this height. Now it's not moving, right? So what kind of energy does it have? What kind of energy did this positive work give it? Well, it wasn't kinetic energy because it's at rest and lift it and it's at rest. Well, the type of energy it was given is gravitational potential energy. Okay. Gravitational potential energy. Uh, and so we abbreviate this as GP. E, gravitational potential energy. And the gravitational potential energy of an object is equal to its mass times acceleration due to gravity times its height above some reference. This could be the floor, it could be the top of a table, this could be the surface of the earth, some reference, some height above some reference. So gravitational potential energy is always calculated with reference to some, some zero point. In this case, it's, let's say this is the floor. Why is it called gravitational potential energy? Well, if we let go of it, gravity does work on it. Gravity exerts a force equal to its weight, mg, through a distance, h. Mg's down, its displacement is down, and so the work done by gravity is equal to mgh. So if an object is a height h above a surface, if it was allowed to, it would fall that height h. And then while falling, gravity would do work on it. And that work due to gravity would be equal to the force due to gravity, mg, its weight, multiplied by the distance through, up, through which that force is applied, h. And so this is potential energy because if an object has gravitational potential energy, that means gravity has the potential to do work on it. Right? It has this potential. If allowed to, that work will be done, increasing its energy. Let's say, whoa, 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 wait. If, it, if we allow it to, to drop and gravity does work on it, isn't it getting closer to the surface? And so isn't its gravitational energy decreasing? It is. Its gravitational potential energy is decreasing. I shouldn't have said gravity has the potential to do work on it and increase its energy. You cannot increase the energy of an object. You can only change the form of its energy, as we'll talk about. Whenever we let go of it and allow gravity to do work on it, its gravitational potential energy decreases. But at the same time, What's happening is it's speeding up as it's traveling to the surface, and so its kinetic energy is increasing. So the gravitational potential energy, when we let go of it, 
is converted into kinetic energy as it falls to the ground. And so the potential, gravitational potential energy decreases while the kinetic energy increases. And right before it hits the ground, its height is equal to zero. So it has no gravitational potential energy and its velocity is a maximum. All of its energy is been converted into kinetic energy. So gravitational potential energy is the potential of gravity to do work on an object and increase the object's kinetic energy. Not its overall energy, it's kinetic energy. Because whenever gravity does work on the object, what happens is that gravitational potential energy gets converted into kinetic energy. And that idea of energy of an object not being able to be increased or decreased, it can just change form, let's say from gravitational potential energy into kinetic energy, that's the conservation of mechanical energy. So mechanical energy, the mechanical energy of a system, Struggle with my spelling today. Mechanical energy is the total energy associated with motion. And as of right now, we're going to say mechanical energy is equal to the sum of the kinetic energy of the object and the gravitational potential energy of an object. So that's mechanical energy. So mechanical energy, we'll abbreviate Me, is equal to Ke plus GPE, kinetic energy plus gravitational potential energy. So that's what mechanical energy is. It's the sum of the kinetic energy and the gravitational potential energy. Now, that mechanical energy will be conserved. And we talked about conservation uh, principle with momentum. Momentum is conserved, meaning that it's constant, it doesn't change. Uh, and that's the same thing with mechanical energy. The amount of mechanical energy of a system is constant, it does not change. It's conserved if, so mechanical energy is conserved if no non-conservative forces do work on an object, or I should say a system, on a system. So if no non-conservative forces do work on a system, then mechanical energy of that system is conserved. Now, the question, what is a non-conservative force? So, uh, an, easier way, an easier way to answer that question is to say, what is a conservative force? A conservative force can be defined kind of in two ways. Work done by a conservative force is independent of the path. Another definition is a conservative force is work done by a conservative, uh, just a conservative. force is zero in a closed path. Okay, now what does that mean? Let's say gravity, for example, is a conservative force. If we have an object and it starts at point A, right, and we lift it to point B, 
Now, whenever we lift it, any time, say we lift it in this path, along this path here. Every time that it's moving parallel to the, uh, the downward motion, upward or downward, gravity is doing work on the object. Here, as we lift it up, the weight of the object is acting down. Its displacement is up, so gravity does negative work. Here, the object is moving horizontal. Gravity acts down, so that's no work. Right? Gravity does no work. But as it's moving down here, its displacement is down, gravity, its weight acts down, so gravity is doing positive work. Zero work as it's horizontal. Negative work, negative work, negative work, negative work, negative work, zero. Positive, 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 zero, zero. Negative, 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 zero. Positive, because gravity and displacement in the same direction. Zero. Negative, 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 zero, a little bit of positive, zero, negative, 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 zero, negative, 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 zero, positive, positive, positive. So depending on whether it's moving up or down, it says whether gravity is doing positive or negative work on the object. Because anytime the object's moving up, gravity acting down is doing negative work. Right? Gravity is acting in the opposite direction as the displacement of the object. Anytime the object is moving down, gravity is doing positive work. But if you add all the positive and negative work up, gravity will have done a work equal to mgh. It's negative. This is the work due to gravity. Because gravity acts down and and gravity and the object's displacement ultimately is up, right? H. So this is not its potential energy. This is the work due to gravity. The, poten the gravitational potential energy of an object is equal to the negative of the work done by gravity, right? Work done by gravity is negative. Now, if you let go of it, gravity will do positive work as it pulls it down. And as we lift it, gravity does negative work on it, and H. And it doesn't matter if we follow this loop, or if we go like this, or if we go this path, or if we go this path. If you sum up all the positive and all the negative work, the total amount of work done by gravity will be negative mgh. Negative mgh, negative mgh, negative mgh, no matter what path we take from A to B. So that's the first definition of a conservative force. The work done by a conservative force is independent of the path. It doesn't matter how we ultimately move, from A to B, the work done by gravity will be the same, moving from A to B. The second definition is what if A and B are the same point? And we can move in any path, the total work done by gravity will equal zero, because ultimately its displacement is equal to zero. Right? But so this would be positive work, positive work, positive work by gravity. Zero, negative, 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 zero, 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 pa, uh, negative, 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 zero, positive, zero, negative, 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 zero, positive, as it moves down. And if you add all the negative and positive work up, it'll total to zero because it ultimately ends at the same point. Spot. Right? It has no additional energy than it had before at the same spot. So the work done by a conservative force is zero in a closed path. So gravity is a conservative force because it satisfies these two conditions. So gravity can do work on an object and mechanical energy will still be conserved. Right? And here's a little thing. Oops. Any force that's conservative that acts on an object, whenever you do work against that force, that force will give work back out. And therefore, when you do work against a conservative force, you're adding potential energy 
to the system. So if we do work against gravity, we're adding energy to the system. In what form? Gravitational potential energy. Um, a spring, something that's elastic, it's a conservative force. So if we push against the spring, if we do work against a conservative force, then what we're doing is we're increasing the potential energy of the system because that conservative force will give that work back. Uh, and that's the elastic potential force, elastic potential energy. Electric fields, doing work against an electric field, it's conservative, right? It's independent of the path and it's zero in a closed path. So therefore, when you do work against an object in an electric field, you're giving it electric potential energy. If you do work against an object in a magnetic field, then, then, uh, you're, uh, then you're giving it magnetic potential energy. So uh, when you do work against any conservative force, you're adding potential energy to the system. So we do work against gravity, we're adding gravitational potential energy. So because gravity is a conservative force, uh, gravitational potential energy, uh, well, that gives it gravitational potential energy, we do work against it, and mechanical energy is conserved if gravity alone is acting on it. A non-conservative force is a force uh, that this is not true. Right? And any other force, basically the ones I've listed, are pretty much all non-conservative forces. Like, sort of, for example, friction, right? A friction, if an object slides on the surface, let's say you have a block and it slides from here to here, its displacement is D, that's the distance to travel. The force of friction is Fk. The work done is Fk times D. But let's say there's you know, a little bump in there that increases D, D prime is a little bit larger than D. Well, that's more surface it has to slide across. So that's more friction that's going to be more work done against it. So frictional force is path dependent, right? It's path dependent. Let's say if you have like a, like a half pipe, you have a block, and if it slides, this is location one, location two, and location three, the slides from one to two, two to three, and three to two, friction will have done more work on it and slow it down compared to if it just went from one to two. It'll be traveling faster because it just traveled a shorter distance. And, uh, and so friction acted on it less, and so it didn't slow down as much. But if it slides back up to three and then back down to two, friction acted on it more, so it'll be moving slower at two after traveling this path. So work done by friction, for example, is path dependent. All right? And so it's not a conservative force. And so whenever a friction does work, whenever a non-conservative force does work on an object that results in a, to a change in total energy. However, if a conservative force, if only conservative forces are acting on an object, then the mechanical energy, the total energy of the system is conserved. It's constant. Let's look at an example. All right, let's say we have an object whose mass is one kilogram. It starts at a height of 10 meters above the ground. Right, so it's up here. Potential energy in joules, or gravitational potential energy, and the total mechanical energy in joules.
height in meters. So at time, say, t equals one, uh, 0 seconds, its height is 10, its velocity is 0. So its kinetic energy, if velocity is 0, remember kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared, gravitational potential energy is mgh. So its kinetic energy is equal to 0 because velocity is 0. Its potential energy is mgh. So its mass times g, 9.8 times h, which is 98 joules. And its total mechanical energy is going to be 98 joules. After one second, what is its velocity? Well, its acceleration is equal to g downward. And g is 9.8 meters per second squared downward. So after one second, its velocity is 9.8 meters per second. So its kinetic energy is going to be uh, 1 half, 0.5 times mass, 1 times its velocity, 9.8 squared. That word square is. So it's 48.02 joules. What's its potential energy? Well, we need to know its height. Okay. Well, its velocity here was initially was at zero. Now its final velocity is 9.8 meters per second. Right. So we know that um, h, or the distance it traveled, say y, is distance y is equal to 1 half v initial plus v final times t. t, how much second elapsed? We're just doing one second. So v initial is 0, so it's equal to 1 half v final 9.8 meters per second times one second. So h is equal to 9.8 times uh, one. Oh, times 0.5. So it's 4.9. Oh, that's the distance it traveled. So the height it is above the ground is 10 minus that. And so, we calculate the potential energy, 5.1 meters times m, which is 1, times g, 1.8, gives me 49.98. Now if we add Ke plus Me, plus, sorry, Ke plus kinetic energy plus gravitational potential energy, so I add to the 49.98, I add to that 48.02, I get 98. Right? So the total mechanical energy remained the same. What happened is some of the potential energy got converted into kinetic energy. So it has more kinetic energy because it has a non-zero velocity, has less potential energy because it's not as high. Well, I feel like one second later it's going to hit the ground, right? Um, but let's see, if we go one second later, its height is going to be 10 minus 1 half. Uh, now its velocity is going to be 19.6. Times two. Yeah, it hits the ground after two seconds. I'm going to just call it a little audible here. 
and say it's 100 meters above the ground. And so then this is, instead of being 5.1, it's 100 minus 4.9, 95.1. So now we have more space to fall. So now I'm just starting at h equals 100 meters. So because I added a 10 to its h, I just increased the potential energy by a factor of 10, and therefore the mechanical energy by a factor of 10. Everything else will be increased by a factor of 10. All right, so after 19.6 seconds, this is going to be its height, 100 minus the distance it traveled. So initial velocity is zero, final velocity at two seconds is 19.6. So 100 minus 0.5 times 19.6 times two. That's uh, 80.4. Now if we calculate its potential and uh, gravitational potential mechanical energies from these velocities and heights. Uh, 0.5 times 1 times 19.6 squared. That's its kin uh, kinetic energy. 192.08. And its gravitational potential energy is 1 m times 9.8 times h, 80.4. 787. Point nine two, and if you add this and that, it should equal nine eighty. Nine eighty. So you see that the sum of its kinetic and its potential are always equaling the same. Okay, and if we if we do one more, so here it's velocity. It's going to be 9.8 after 3 seconds times 3, 29.4. All right, so then we're going to put 29.4 times 3. It's going to be our, our height, 100 times 0.5 times 20. 100 minus 0.5 times 29. Four times three, fifty-five point nine. So using this, calculating uh, gravitational potential energy. We have fifty-five point nine times one kilogram times nine point eight, five hundred forty-seven. But uh, kinetic energy is 0.5 times 1 kilogram times velocity 29.4 squared, 432.18. Add kinetic potential. Nine eight. So you see what's happening? Kinetic energy is increasing. So you can see that, sorry, I should have, these, I couldn't just cut multiply those by 10. I was wrong. So these are increasing, the kinetic energy is going from 0 to 48 to 192 to 432. 
And the potential energy is decreasing as it falls from 980, 932 to 788 uh, to 548. It's decreasing as the kinetic energy is increasing, but the sum of the kinetic energy and the potential energy are remaining the same. So our energy is being conserved. It's just being converted from one form, gravitational potential energy, into another form, kinetic energy. And if we continue, we're, we're falling almost halfway, right? We're starting 100 meters above the ground. We're almost halfway, 55.9 or 56 meters above the ground. As we continue to fall, the gravitational potential energy continues to decrease. Kinetic energy continues to increase until we got to here, where height is zero. The kinetic energy would now be 980 joules. The gravitational potential energy would be zero. And the total mechanical energy would be 980 joules. So what is the velocity here? So now, at a height zero, right at the ground, all of the gravitational potential energy has been converted into kinetic energy. So we originally had all gravitational potential and no kinetic. Now we have all kinetic, no gravitational potential. Still the same amount of uh, total mechanical energy. But what is this velocity? Well, we can find that velocity. One half mv squared equals the kinetic energy here at the, the ground. So 980 joules. And so we get v equals uh, the square root of 2 times 980 joules divided by 1 kilogram. So take 980 times 2 and the square root of that is we get a velocity of 44.27 meters per second. So now, we have a new way of calculating the velocity of an object that we drop from rest using the conservation of mechanical energy. If it starts from rest up here at state 1, at a height h, and v is equal to 0, then the ener mechanical energy at location 1 is equal to gravitational potential energy at 1 plus the kinetic energy which 1, which is equal to mgh plus 0. Right before it hits the ground at state 2, it has some velocity, right? Its h is equal to 0. It's right before it hits the ground. Right? Now its mechanical energy at state 2 is equal to this gravitational potential energy at state 2 plus this kinetic energy at state 2. This is now 0. 1 half mv squared, where this velocity is that velocity. Now the total mechanical energy is conserved. So we can write. Falling. The mechanical energy at point one is equal to the mechanical energy at point two. And so that is mgh is equal to one half mv squared. M's cancel off. So the velocity is going to equal the square root of gh. Oh, two gh. That's the velocity of an object. If an object is dropped from rest, that's the velocity from a height h. That's its velocity right before it hits the ground. Right? We can derive this from the conservation of mechanical energy. So if it starts from rest, from a height h above the ground, its velocity right before it hits the ground is the square root of 2 g h. Doesn't matter what its mass is, its mass canceled out. It could be a bowling ball, it could be a ping pong, 
what we're ignoring here is air resistance, though. Air resistance is a non-conservative force, right? It's path dependent, and so mechanical energy will not be conserved. If air drag or air resistance is not negligible, then it will do negative work on the object as it falls, because the resistance is up as it falls down. So it will take away energy from the system, and the energy it has before it hits the ground will not be the same amount of energy it had when it started. It will be a little bit less. So mechanical energy will not be conserved. The sum of its gravitational potential energy and kinetic energy before it was dropped will not equal the sum of its mechanical energy, uh, the potential energy, and kinetic energy at the bottom. In fact, if there's air drag, if there's a non-conservative force, then mechanical energy in state one is equal to the mechanical energy in state two plus the work done by non-conservative forces. So mechanical energy will not be conserved. There will be a difference. And if you see, if you subtract over, mechanical energy 1 minus mechanical energy 2 equals the work done by non-conservative forces. And so the work done equals the change in, oh, actually, um, because the work as it falls would be negative, this would be mechanical energy 2 equals mechanical energy state 1 plus the work done. So this is the change in mechanical energy is equal to the work done by non-conservative forces. Uh, in the case of air drag, right, the work done by non-conservative forces would be negative, and so the change in mechanical energy would be negative. It would have less energy when it hits the ground than it did when it was dropped. So the amount of kinetic energy it has when it hits the ground is less than the amount of potential, gravitational potential energy it has there. And this is, I don't know, I forgot to write it up here. The work energy theorem. That the change in mechanical energy of the system is equal to the work done by non-conservative forces on the system. Right, so whatever non-conservative forces do work on the system, that amount of work is going to equal the change in mechanical energy of the system. Right. So now we're going to look at uh, at power. So power is equal to the rate of change in energy. So it's a change in mechanical energy divided by the amount of time it took for that change in mechanical energy to occur. Now because the change in mechanical energy is also equal to the work done by non-conservative forces, you can also look at power as equal to the rate at which work is done. Right? And so uh, the units of power are joules per second. Right? Because work and energy are units of joules times seconds. And one joule per second is equal to one watt. Right? Or we just call it we abbreviate watt with a capital W. And so if you think about uh, like, a, like a motor, an engine, um, we, we quantify the amount of work, we, we quantify the rate at which 
that engine or, or motor can do work on the system by giving its power output, how much power it can output. So let's say if a engine or a motor is has a maximum power output of power output, so capital P, not a vector, that's momentum, P with the vector arrow, plane P, that's the scale of power. Say so an engine has a power of 100 watts. Well, if that's the power output, then uh, how fast can it lift a one kilogram mass 10 meters in the air? Okay. Well, how much work does it have to do to lift this one kilogram uh, mass 10 meters? Well, the work done by the motor is equal to um, the mass of the object times g times h, which is 1 kilogram times 9.8 meters per second squared times 10 meters, 980 joules of work it takes to lift it, to lift a 1 kilogram mass 10 meters high. Now, if the power is equal to the rate at which work can be done, then the minimum amount of time can be found by rearranging the equation. So the amount of work needs to be done is 980. The total amount of po total power output is 100 watts. So the minimum amount of time is 980 divided by 100, 9.8 seconds. So that's the fastest that that, that engine could lift that one kilogram of mass 10 meters high. Because this engine can only do 100 watts of work. Oh, sorry, it only has power output of 100 watts. That means it can only do 100 joules of work every second. And in order to lift this object, this one kilogram object, 10 meters high, that's a total of 98, uh, 980 joules. But it can only do 100 watts or 100 joules per second, uh, joules of work per second, it'll take a total of 9.8 seconds to lift it that high. Right, so the greater the power output, of a motor, the faster it can lift, the faster it can change the energy of the object it's doing work on. Uh, the the uh, I forget the conversion exactly, but the uh, English unit of power is horsepower, right? Uh, horsepower is what we typically use for engines, right? An engine of a car has this many horsepower of work. I think it's like 700 something watts is one horsepower. So, um, if an engine has a certain amount of horsepower, that tells you how fast it can change the energy of the car. Now, when we talk about cars, we're, we're usually talking about changing kinetic energy, right? So, if a car has a given power right uh, and let's say let's say we want a speed of 30 meters per second what's the minimum amount of time that a car with a given of the engine with a given amount of power can reach that speed well power equals change in mechanical energy over time. Here the change in mechanical energy is we're going from rest to one half mv squared. That's a change in mechanical energy. We're going from rest to this zero. Okay, so the power 
uh, to solve for time. Uh, that would give us the, the time. If we knew the power output of the engine, we know the final speed and the mass, we could figure out the minimum amount of time it takes to reach that speed. So if you say here, like, oh, this car can reach 0 to 60 miles per hour in, in 1.2 seconds, what they're telling you is the power output of the motor. So they can say it can go 0 to 60 miles per hour in however long, right? So they're giving you the change in kinetic energy, the amount of time. So they're basically describing the power output of that engine. The larger, more power the engine has, the shorter the period of time it takes to reach a given speed because the engine can do more work in a shorter period of time. The rate of work, a rate at which the work can be done, is faster. Now, um, so that's power and watt. We usually use uh, watt here, watt in terms of electricity a lot, uh, like a like a 50 watt or 100 watt light bulb. And so, what that means is light has energy too. Light is energy, is a form of energy. And so if you have a light bulb, if we measure the amount of energy in the form of light and heat coming out of that light bulb, the amount of energy per second would be 100 Watts. So, uh, a 100 watt light bulb means that 100 joules of energy come out of that light bulb every second in the form of light and heat. So, uh, assuming it's an efficient light, that a small amount of the electric potential energy is converted to heat, and most of the energy is converted into visible light, the higher the power output, the more energy per unit time, right? So if you have a large power output bulb, then there's going to be a lot of energy emitted per unit time, so it's going to be brighter. If you ever looked at your, at your energy bill for electricity, they measure how much energy you used, uh, and that's what you pay for, the amount of energy that you used. And how they calculate it. Well, the grid, the electrical power grid that your house is connected to, apply, uh, uh, supplies your house with a certain amount of power. So it's giving your house a certain amount of energy every second, right? And that's constant, right? So it's, and, and that's measured in kilowatts, so thousands of watts. The power company calculates how much energy you use by basically measuring the amount of time you're connected to the power. Because energy, power, is equal to energy over time. So energy is equal to power times time. So if your house is being supplied a constant amount of power, you can calculate the amount of energy you used by multiplying that power supply by how long you were plugged into it. And so your energy bill, if you ever pay attention to it, the units of energy are kilo, kilowatt hours. Kilowatt hours. Now this isn't a, like a normal physical unit. But it technically is a unit of energy because it's power multiplied by time. So that is a unit of energy. And that's the unit of energy that the electric company measures your energy consumption in. The kilowatt hours that are supplied by whatever your electrical utility is multiplied by how many hours you were drawing power from it. That's how they calculate your 
energy use. So um, if you have a, an air conditioner, you plug in that air conditioner, the amount of energy consumed by it is equal to the power that was supplied to it by the grid multiplied by how long um, it, was, it was drawing power from the grid. That's the amount of energy they consumed. And so that's, that's, the, that's what's uh, reported on your bill. Right, so that, include, that concludes our uh, lecture on energy. Right? This conservation of mechanical energy was very useful in solving problems. Uh, and so is the work energy theorem. And we'll see that when we look at some example problems.